Welcome to the Open Heat Transfer Course Conduction. This course is organized by RWTH Aachen University and the University of Twente. My name is Wilco Rolfs. In this video, we will look to, on, to the unsteady energy conservation equations. Here a little overview of the video. So in the last video, we looked at steady state energy conservation equations without sources in the one and two dimensional space. In addition, we introduced the topic of energy sources and sinks. In this video, we will expand the equation to a transient process. So first we start with a two dimensional transient conduction equation. And finally, we will expand this to the three dimensional space. The learning goals are first to understand the concept of internal energies and the specific heat and to understand the differences from the internal energy to, for instance, kinetic or potential energy. Then to distinguish between the specific heat at constant temperature and constant pressure for gases. And the second main learning goal of this video is similar to the one of the video before it is the topic of energy balances. So how to set up the energy balance for the different cases and how to develop the differential equation from that using Taylor series expansion. The next videos will then deal with the establishment of boundary conditions and of course uh, for solving the differential equations for simple cases. Now let's start with the internal energy. Here a little definition. The internal energy of a thermodynamic system is the energy contained with it. So this is pretty rough set and we need to distinguish or specify this a little bit more. So the next sentence says it does not contain kinetic energy of motion of the whole system or the system as a whole, nor the potential energy of the system as a whole due to external forces. What does this mean? So first of all, we have to look onto the micro or nano system. So all the random motions of the molecules are contained in the inner energy. This means that the large scale motions that we can see like a fluid flow is the kinetic energy of the system and will not be dealt with in the internal energy. And the same is with the potential energy if I lift off a heavy uh, body, I will increase its potential energy. And this has nothing then to do with the inner energy of the object. So what are examples for the inner energy? energy? This is, for instance, a thermal energy, but also chemical bonding energies. The second important st uh, point is that the internal energy is a measure as a difference from a reference state. This we can also compare to the potential energy. If I'm staying on a large mountain and I lift a stone up by, let's say, two meters, then the potential energy can be defined once, like as the energy that I create by lifting it up by two meters. But if I would throw the stone downwards the hill, it has, of course, a much higher potential energy. So it depends on the reference state, how to calculate this energy. And it is often uh, important to utilize a correct and unique um, reference state for the entire calculations. And finally, only the differences between the reference state and the current states of interest. What do we deal with here in the course heat transfer as internal energy. So we only consider here the change of the internal energy by temperature variations and in some cases by phase change processes such for instance melting evaporation or sublimation. We do not consider chemical bonding energies here in this course but let's go further and see how we can then deal with this internal energy. So we use here the internal energy that is caused by temperature variations. So it's like here the 
change of the internal energy by a temperature change. And we ex can express this first by the specific internal energy. So it's a small u letter for the internal, um, for specific energy. And then this du dt, if we consider this as a linear process, this here can be a constant and then we call this the specific heat capacity. Now there are two different specific heat capacities for gases and we have to look on the differences. So first of all, I would look at a case where the addition of heat is happening at a variable volume, which means that the pressure inside the volume maintains constant, but because we increase the internal energy, there is an increase in volume. This is shown here in this picture. So we have one kilogram of air, which we will increase by a temperature of one Celsius. And due to that, we have a change of the volume. And on the outer side here, we have our pressure, the ambient pressure, and we have to work against this ambient pressure. So there is a mechanical work involved in this process. And as such, as an example here for air, we have to utilize or we have to increase the inner energy by 1007 joule in order to increase the temperature by one degree Celsius. Now, on the other side, we could do a similar experiment, but now maintain the volume to be constant. So due to the constant volume, we will have, of course, an increase in pressure, not an increase in volume. And due to that, we have here, as shown in this picture, a smaller energy that we need to increase the temperature by one degree Celsius because we do not have to do this mechanical work. And so we have these two different definitions and we have to deal with them in the um, problems. But now, what are specific values for that? Now we look at the, const, uh, the usual conditions of 289 Kelvin and one bar, and we check what is the specific heat capacity for constant pressure for gases, for instance. We have here three gases as examples, air, helium, and hydrogen. And we can see that Cp can be of very large difference. So for air, it's a thousand, and for hydrogen, it's a 14,000. And in all cases, as we have seen that there's a difference by the work that needs to be done, the volume, um, con um, the heat capacity for constant volume is always lower by the missing work that has not been um, given to the system. Now, for liquids and solids, there is no distinction between CP and CV. So for typical liquids, I think water is one of the most important parts. We have the CP of 4,220 and oils. This is always a typical oil, so they might vary a little bit in the different oils. But here we have values around 1,800. For solids, we have iron. There it's a 400. 47 and wood 1380. Please keep in mind that it's specific heat capacity, so per kilogram, then you will need to multiply this value of iron with the um, density of iron, which is much larger than the density of wood. And as such, now on the volume specific part, the iron would have a higher heat capacity if we have two objects of the same volume that we compare. Now, having had a first look on the specific heat capacity, we look our, at our control volume. Here again, we have ingoing and outgoing fluxes and this change of internal energy by time. Because if there's a difference in the ingoing and outgoing fluxes, there will be a change of the internal energy. So we have already seen this. The internal energy is equal to the mass times a specific um, heat capacity times the temperature. Now we can expand this because we can change the mass to be 
the volume, dx, dy, dz. This is the volume of the control, um, control volume here. And we can, to get to a mass, multiply this by the density. The units here for the internal energy is joule. Then the density, it's clear, it's kilogram per cubic meter. And the specific heat capacity, it's joule per kilogram Kelvin. So we can have a look. We can check the units. So if there is a change of the internal energy, this one will be balanced by the heat flows, ingoing and outgoing heat flows. We know that heat, these heat flows are in the unit of watt. So we can see this from here. The Q dot is equal to the Q dot double dash watt per square meter times the area through which this heat is um, uh, entering the control volume. So this will be of a unit watt. And then the change of the internal energy by time will be joule per second also watt. So we can um, add them in the energy balance and they are on the right unit. How does it work? So we consider here changes. Let's stop and start this new. In the energy balance itself, it is the change of the internal energy that matters. So let's look at the internal energy change that we can describe here for a case of constant properties, CV and rho are in this case constant over the temperature range we are considering now. Then we can look at a change of the internal energy in our control volume that we have drawn here. So it is the control volume dx dy times one being in a two dimensional space times uh, density. So we come up with a mass times the mass specific heat capacity at constant volume because we remain our control volume to be constant times the temperature change over time. This is the quantity that we have to consider in our energy balance. Now, how do we write the energy balance? In the videos before, we have always mentioned that it is smart to write down all the fluxes that go over the phases of our control volume on the right side. So let's do that again. We use here the absolute fluxes, so not area specific ones, Qx in minus Qx out. So this is for the uh, x direction, Qy in minus Qy out. This is for the y direction, plus then what we have here is the um, volume specific heat um, source times the volume, the control volume size. So this volume is again dy dx and times one. We have written this all on the right side. On the left side, we can now write the change of the internal energy by time. Why do we do that? So if we compare it, so on the right side, we have now the changes of the heat flows and the source terms. The changes means that it's the difference between ingoing and outgoing on each of the directions. And they are on the right side of the energy balance because they will be the cause of the effect. And the effect is a temporal change of the internal energy, which we then write on the left side. The same applies also in fluid mechanics to the momentum equation, but I think this can be taught in the course fluid mechanics. So now if we have the energy balance, we can include all the definitions. So on the Qx in minus Qx out, we apply again Fourier law and we apply the Taylor series expansion. Of course, first the Taylor series expansion to remove Qx in and to maintain only the change of the heat flux over the distance dx. And then we use Fourier's law and we come up to a second order differential equation. And we know this already from the previous video. And we also know the 
part here that we have the volumetric heat generation in here. And we have seen that all those variables, the 1, the dx, and the dy, they cancel out in this process. So now, changing the uh, inner energy using the definition that we have above here, we can write this as rho Cv times the change of the temperature over time. And then we can bring all the prefactors from the left side to the right side. So we have the change of the temperature over time is being 1 over rho Cv times now the conductive parts, lambda times the uh, second order uh, gradients of the temperature plus the volumetric heat generation rate. Now let's expand this to three dimensions. I think the process is clear. It is really um, straightforward to the red and the green parts. We also add the fluxes in Z direction. And from that we can here have also the resulting temperature profile. I don't want to go into detail here because it's really the same process. So we end up with the equation here on the bottom. Now, a little overview of those different processes we have had first in the video before the 1D steady state heat um, transfer equation without sources. So we see zero is equal to um, the second um, derivative of the temperature by x. We can directly see that integrating this twice to get to the temperature, we will obtain a linear profile for the temperature itself. Now we can look at steady state without sources in a two-dimensional part. So we add to the temperature derivatives in x direction, temperature derivatives in y direction. Now, if we look at the case that there is a source, we can just add this source here on the right side as a volumetric heat source or heat sink. Note a heat source is positive, a heat sink will then here on the right side negative because it reduces the internal energy. Again, you see cause and effect on the left side. Here, if you cross out the y term, you immediately see that the second derivative is now being a constant here. And as such, the linear profile will change into a parabolic profile because you have to integrate a constant twice. Now, the transient process will introduce first on the left side the temperature derivative by time, and also here the prefactor accounting for the density and the heat capacity. The same applies here to three um, to three dimensional case where we have the three derivatives with respect to the three coordinates. This is uh, nearly the, the video. Let's look at the comprehension questions. So the first question, what is the steady state temperature profile for a homogeneous one dimensional flat wall without heat sources? We ex explained this a slide before. So what you have is actually a zero is equal to the second derivative of the temperature with respect to the coordinate. And from that integrating it twice, you will come up with a linear profile. The question then is, under which conditions does the Poisson equation become Laplace equation? I think we had this also in the video before. It is also um, the difference is the uh, volumetric heat generation that is absent in the Laplace equation, but it's given in the Poisson equation. Thank you for your attention and see you in the next video.